All right, good morning and welcome to the 2022 National Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment Session called Positively You, Developing a Community-Informed Social Media Initiative for Engagement in Care. My name is Babak Yakmai, and I am a public analyst here at uh, the HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau's Division of Metropolitan HIV AIDS Program, which is short for DMAP, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. Um, thank you for joining today's session. It's going to be a fun one, uh, and as you participate in the session and have some questions or anything like that, um, please use the chat uh, box uh, for your questions or comments. And then at the conclusion of the session, uh, the presenters will have the opportunity to address those questions during the Q&A. Now, um, in terms of uh, just some housekeeping items, we encourage attendees to ask questions using the chat function, but please know that any inappropriate comment or uh, question or anything like that that's inappropriate, the attendee will be uh, removed from the session. We're begat, about to begin a wonderful presentation for today's session, and um, please let's begin the recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Positively You, developing a community-informed social media initiative for engagement in care. My name is John Sapero. I'm the director of Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiatives at Collaborative Research. I'll be moderating today's presentation and moving us forward in the conversation. And I'm joined today by three folks who did a phenomenal job of developing and implementing this campaign. Jeremy Hivernan and Kate Thomas from the Ryan White Part A program of Maricopa County in Phoenix, Arizona and Elijah Palace, a Positively You ambassador who took part in the campaign. First, I wanna really thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to share this campaign as are my co-presenters. Today, we are hoping that you will walk away having learned how we identified the need for a young adult program and developed Positively You, a complimentary media campaign to promote that program. We think you'll be excited to explore Positively You and also the Positively Peers mobile app and how we are using them to successfully support young people with HIV. You'll get to learn how we used a very community-driven process to inform the development and implementation of a campaign. And most importantly, I think you're gonna walk away very excited about implementing a similar initiative in your area. And to start us off, uh, Jeremy will lead our presentation by sharing how we developed the framework for the Positively You initiative. Jeremy, I'll pass to you. Thank you, John. And again, thank you to everyone who's uh, joining us today. Uh, I'm Jeremy Havarna, and I'm the quality manager for the Ryan White Part A program here in Maricopa County in Arizona. Um, this whole project began as a quality improvement initiative of the Phoenix EMA's Clinical Quality Management Committee. We knew based on disparities that we were seeing in uh, rates of new diagnoses, as you'll see on the screen, um, and uh, among uh, for viral suppression rates, um, that our young people ages 18 to 30, uh, particularly from uh, communities of color, were experiencing um, disparities in care and, and diagnoses. And we needed uh, some more input and guidance from them on how we could do better, how we could develop programs and initiatives that would really focus on, on their needs. Uh, so we asked the CQM committee, uh, we posed the question to them about how can we engage young people with HIV in quality improvement initiatives. And after we conducted a brainstorming session and a prioritization uh, matrix process, and uh, we looked at what could be the next step of how we could start engaging young people. And we started very simply with a survey. Um, you may be thinking, here we go, Ryan White programs, we often do surveys, we often uh, do needs assessments, um, but really, what are we doing with that information? So we knew if we're gonna start there, we needed to back up and use that, that information. So um, 
we wanted to gather that initial data from them though like what is it that they need what is it they want from us what is it we could do better for them and we got some uh initial pushback from some of our partners saying young people don't uh participate in surveys they don't participate in needs assessments you're not going to get useful information and our team took that on as a challenge we were like okay watch this we're going to make this happen so we made sure that we didn't just do the normal route of sending out uh, an, an email blast or an electronic request for uh, feedback um, from a survey. And we uh, I chose two of the most outgoing people I know, Kate was one of them, um, to go into organizations and locations where we knew young people were accessing some of our services and accessing medical care and really like bring them in, engage them to do this short under 15 question survey. Um, that took just a few minutes and uh, we ended up getting the largest response we've ever gotten from uh, this population in any previous needs assessments or surveys. And that was really exciting for us. Um, too often we get feedback after the fact in our programming, right? So we're looking at, we've implemented something, we've, we've tried out a new project, and then we go to the individuals using the pro program or our services and say, Tell us what you think about this. How can we, we do better? We wanted to break that cycle and make sure that what we were developing and putting out was something that um, our key population we were trying to reach was informing from the get-go. Next slide, please. So we conducted the survey in the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. And one of the most glaring results from that survey was that our young people were simply not aware of all of the services, the wide range of services we offer through the Part A program. So you'll see on the graph um, that says helpful additional services. We asked them specifically, um, we listed a number of services and or, or um, resources and said, what of these would you find most helpful? What are you most needing um, uh, to access? And these eight services listed here you can see that a third or more up to 50 percent almost 50 percent of, of respondents said they needed these services and these are all services that our program offers or is connected to so if they're saying this is what we need and we offer it there's a disconnect between what we're communicating to them and how we're educating our clients on what's available and when we looked at this we realized there were two things as, as the reason why. Um, when individuals are coming into our program, they're usually coming in in a couple of different ways, right? They're newly diagnosed or they're um, aging out of pediatric, pediatric HIV care, or they've just moved here, or they had a, a life change where now they need Ryan Way assistance. And when they come into our program, they get a lot of information. And they're probably learning about and hearing about these services that's a lot of information to retain. It's a lot of information to try to remember later on when you need something specific, right? Um, and then also, we looked at the service directory that we were using for the last 10 plus years, and it was, quite frankly, unattractive. It was not engaging. It was very wordy, super wordy, and difficult to understand and navigate and to know what someone might qualify for or what an actual service was using service category language rather than plain language about what the service was. So those were that was, you know, those were two of the things we were quickly identified we need to do better at. One of the positive signs that you'll see in the other table uh, on the screen is that young people were aware of U equals U. They were getting that message. And what you don't see on here, we also asked them how you learned that, and they were getting it from a, uh, a variety of, of uh, resources, their medical provider, their case manager, from the HIV testing site where they tested positive, uh, from, the, uh, from family and friends sometimes. So that was really exciting. But then we were concerned because just because they knew about U equals U, that didn't necessarily translate into full uh, treatment adherence um, and full uh, medical um, appointment adherence. So we knew we had two main goals that we wanted to address from the, from the results we were seeing. Awareness of services 
And how can we better talk to young people about U equals U and the importance of that message? Next slide. So we identified some pro uh, programmatic goals, right? I already mentioned our, our key uh, audience for this, uh, for this project, this program, was young adults 18 to 30 um, with HIV. We've since expanded that to include individuals up to age 34 based on trends we've been seeing in our data. And we also wanted it focused on people who work in and out of care. We know our program and our subrecipient agencies provide high quality, compassionate HIV care and supportive services. And those services are free or low cost. And they also provide navigation to other resources in the community that we don't necessarily fund. But awareness on that information was low. So we wanted to raise that awareness. And then finally, we wanted to continue to promote undetectable equals untransmittable. With our goals, our hope was that the better knowledge, a better knowledge of services would bring, uh, not only bring young people back into care who've fallen out of care, but would help link new clients into our program and help prevent them from falling out of care in the future. The more services they're connected to, the more connections that they have with our program, the more likely they are to stay engaged in their services and their care. We also knew that the resources we would be developing while focused towards the, this uh, population, these uh, young people, could benefit all um, people with HIV in our community that needed um, or could access our services. And finally, we always want to we always want to end something like this with a call to action. And that act, that call to action has been very consistent through the through the campaign. You know, apply now, see what you qualify for, see how we can help you, see what's available for you. So that has been um, really crucial. As we um, began to analyze the results from the survey, we took the group that really designed the questions and designed the survey and, and, and put the survey out and we formalized the Young Adult Support Squad or the YES, because in Ryan White, we love an acronym. Um, and uh, Kate will talk more about, about that, uh, that group in, in a few minutes, but we really wanted to have individuals who could look at how we can improve the awareness of our services. And then entered ending the HIV epidemic funding. So we began to be able to think in a bigger scope than we could have imagined before. Because of limitations on our, on our, our party funding, on marketing and such, we could start looking at how we could better reach community in different ways than we could before. You talked a lot about the data analyses you did and how that work drove you to make some program, programmatic decisions and kind of lay out the framework for eventually became positively you. Talk about the qualitative data a little bit more that you used and gathering that. Yeah, so while the survey was being um, rolled out um, and we were gathering information that way from, from uh, young people, I also reached out to one of our subrecipient agencies who um, hosts an empowerment group for and by young queer people of color and ask them if I could come in and do a focus group and, and really sit down and ask them um, uh, about how we could do better. I literally went in with a set of questions about like, um, what do your peers need? How can we engage with them? What would bring them in to talk to us about how we can do better or design programs for, for specifically for them? And um, what's, it quickly did, uh, uh, developed into a education session rather than a focus group. Uh, about half of the individuals in the room were in, people who had were currently or had previously used Ryan White services in our community. Um, and as I started asking them questions, I realized they were not aware of the services we had to offer. So I was I um, started. They asked me, can you give me a, can you give us an overview of the program first? And so I started talking about the services and someone was like, wait, you offer dental insurance coverage? I didn't know that. And so as I started then talking about the services, light bulbs were going off. And um, so I literally spent most of the time educating them and uh, about what was available. So when we walked away from that, we kind of had an idea 
this is already an issue. Uh, let's see what the what the survey says. So we kind of knew in um, before the survey even closed that that was probably going to be one of our focus points, right? Because we, we were we were seeing that. Um, we did do some additional quantitative data analysis after the close of the survey, after we saw the results to confirm that um, based on service usage that we were seeing the same thing. Young people ages 18 to 30 were not using services like nutrition therapy, like um, copay and deductible assistance through our cost sharing assistance program and other things that um, they would could benefit from that individuals using our services older than them were um, signing up for and accessing more often. So we knew there was a disconnect all along the way. It was very clearly shown to us every step um, through that. Um, I'm gonna let Kate in the, in the next section talk a little bit more about the continued you, um, um, way that we gathered qualitative uh, data from our young people as we developed the rest of the program. But from the get-go, that was our main objective. What's the data telling us? What are young people telling us about what they need and what they need from us? Um, yeah. Jeremy, um, before we jump to the next section where I'll talk about more of that development, for those who are thinking about developing a media campaign of their own, could you explain a little bit more about the process that you use to define the ultimate the ultimate programmatic needs and goals? You know, we talked a lot about how it was driven by data, but was there anything else that really led into these are our program goals? So I said I'm a quality manager. I like everything I do stems and starts from the data, right? Trying to make decisions from the data. So we started with that. That was the number one thing. What is our data telling us? But then we started asking um, input from agency, subrecipient agency staff who were working directly with young people. What is it they're seeing? What is the need? Where where is the gap for for these individuals? Um, so we did a lot of that uh, that work as well. Um, <laughs> I sh the back part of this, or the the earlier part of this whole uh, story is the year previous to the survey. Our program tried to develop a a pilot project to retain young people into care and it did not go well and there was not much interest in it and one of the main things that staff told us uh, that we're working with young people was we were asking too much of them we needed to give them tools that would then empower them to make the decisions about their care and 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 the resources that they needed to access so we took a big step back and and started over so that was really helpful um, we also did somewhat look at what else was in, out in the community, out in the country and across the, um, uh, in regards to uh, HIV media and stuff. I really took inspiration uh, personally from the Positively Fearless campaign because they really centered the message around people's stories, people with HIV and their stories. And that was inspiring, but we also wanted to make sure that it was locally driven, that yes those were great things to get some ideas from but the messaging and and the look and the feel all needed to all needed to be very locally driven from our young people so it would work for them so that was really those were kind of the other areas where we we brought stuff in besides just looking at at the data all right next up uh kate thomas is going to uh, share how we translated these programmatic goals into programming for young people with hiv Thanks, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate Thomas. I am the Ending the HIV Epidemic Senior Health Educator with the Party Program in Maricopa County. And I'm not going to lie, this Positivity U campaign is one of the best parts of my job because it's educating the community, it's collaborating with youth and young adults, and it's amazing. So Jeremy already started off the intro, you know, with our YAS, the Young Adult Support Squad. Was that a very intentional acronym? You're absolutely right, it was. <laughs> so we started with fun from the get-go. So after we analyzed the data from the Young Adult Survey, we brought together an interagency group primarily of staff members from Ryan White-funded agencies and subrecipients. And also the YAS has been historically composed 50% of people with HIV and 50% from our key populations. So this group would meet once a month to strategize and coordinate our efforts across agencies. 
you know, it was really important that we not duplicate efforts across multiple agencies when we're all trying to achieve the same goals of engaging and retaining our young folks in care and helping them achieve viral suppression. So working together smarter, not working harder apart, to bridge those silos in public health, right? So from the interagency work group, we knew we wanted to engage with our young people in person to provide that peer-to-peer -peer connection that's so powerful. And back in the pre-COVID days, you know, when we did this survey at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, we had such beautiful goals to hold monthly in-person gatherings for young adults with HIV. The goals of which primarily to give them that opportunity to connect and socialize, and the secondary goal of gathering young adult feedback on their experiences with party services, because we're sneaky like that. But of course, March 2020 rolled along, COVID greatly complicated things, and obviously we were not going to hold in-person meetings during the global pandemic. So like the rest of the world, we moved to Zoom. So our first Zoom chat was held in May 2020, and this was a great opportunity to bring our young adult clients together to first and foremost talk about what mattered to them. They chose the topics of these Zoom chats. So if we were talking about dating and disclosure, if we were talking about how to better partner with your HIV provider to get your health needs met, sometimes we were just talking about the stress of the pandemic. You know, we had a, a wonderful therapist from one of our subrecipient agencies join us and lead a session, you know, how to mostly keep your sanity during the pandemic. And it was just a great opportunity for us to break the stress of being stuck at home during COVID, still providing young people to connect with their peers, and a light sprinkling of informal focus group questions to gather that feedback as we were starting to develop the campaign. And of course, as I'm sure you're all aware, Zoom burnout is a thing. So our Zoom chats did pause in November of 2021, but by that point, the campaign was well underway, which was great. Also, from the Zoom chats, we had our young adult newsletter. Um, it has really changed a lot. We have changed it. It now modified. It reflects the design of the Positively You campaign. And our fabulous community engagement coordinator has really put a lot of time and effort into creating an interactive, or not so much interactive, but just dynamic newsletter with a bunch of things that our young folks want to see and we're successful, whereas most health industry newsletters might have a 28% open rate. Our Positively You newsletter, I think it was over 55% this month. So we are very successful with the newsletter. And that was another way that we would ask questions as we were designing the campaign. We'd share some of our design ideas and ask young people to vote in a quick poll, things like that, constantly gathering that feedback about how we were developing the program. And so the feedback from the young adult support squad, our young adults in our Zoom chats participating, and just those who would maybe occasionally give us some feedback through the newsletter, all informed how we designed and developed the media campaign that would drive young adults to Ryan White Services. Next slide, please. So again, we're having those informal conversations in the Zoom chats, asking quick little questions in our newsletter, and this was some of the feedback we got. They, our young folks discussed how they learned about their HIV diagnosis and what it was like. Did they have support from family or friends to guide them through that time? You know, did they have a chosen family to support them if their blood family was not there? Uh, they definitely shared stories of stigma and discrimination as they move through life or disclose their status to others. But what was really empowering for us and what really drove a lot of the direction of the campaign was that they shared how Ryan White services and care really impacted their outlook and empowered them to take charge of their health, to manage their diagnosis more successfully and easily, and also to give them the confidence that they can do that and that, you know, that, that greater version of themselves when they're taking care of their health. Next slide, please. And like we discussed earlier, our young folks let us know that that peer-to-peer -peer connection was so important to engage others in a young adult program. So we knew this would have to be peer-driven, not just from our Zoom chats, but the campaign itself wasn't going to have staff running it. It was going to be coming from our young folks. Um, and of course, we were told it had to be on social media, accessible from a smartphone. Do not make me scroll down that page. If I have to scroll more than twice, I've been on your site too long. 
So if you log on to PositivelyUAZ.com, you'll see right at the top, apply today, drop down bar to get to the content you need. We even listened to them when it came to that design. And also the design, they did not want any HIV cliches. We don't want to see sad people. We don't want to see a red ribbon anywhere on this campaign. Um, we want the diversity to show that HIV today, there's no one look of HIV. It can affect anyone. This is the diversity we have. And so it was really great feedback that we did integrate into the design that you'll see on the next slide. And once again, our young adult feedback built our campaign framework. They told us the messaging should be positive, uplifting. You can still be you. You're not alone. And thus positively you was born. The real life stories of our great ambassadors who put their faces on an awareness campaign that's the heart of this campaign. And as you can see from these great quotes, you know, you can forget that you have HIV, you know, living your best life without the fear of passing to others. You know, there's that undetectable equals untransmittable message. And in the center, positivamente imparable, positively unstoppable. You know, we are Maricopa County in Arizona, so everything's English and Spanish for this campaign. And the reaction from not only the participants, but also from our young adults in our Zoom chats, and seeing it on the newsletter. What, I mean, when your community, we've been asking them every step of the way, how's this color? How's this setting? How's this music? And when the feedback comes in that we listened to them, they felt heard, they felt seen. And the emotion of that just really let us know that we hit the nail on the head, we got it right. And I am very, very proud of this young adult program and media campaign that work together to help our young adult clients stay in care and achieve viral suppression. So Kate, let me ask you, um, many programs are challenged to get people with HIV involved in anything that they're doing, let alone young people with HIV. What magic did you and Jeremy concoct to uh, get so many young people to take part? Um, well, it wasn't easy, I can tell you that. Uh, to everyone who struggled to recruit young adults to participate in any health initiative, not in the middle of a pandemic, um, I'll just give us some, some extra kudos there, uh, we were relentless. Uh, I am a get stuff done person, so when I am given a task, I'm going to do it. Uh, Jeremy mentioned that I was one of the folks he tapped to go out and collect surveys because I will. I will park it out there and be like, oh my gosh, your shoes come close. You look like you're 18 to 30. Have you taken this feedback survey? So, you know, just being very complimentary, being out in the community and welcoming people. I think that's what's always been successful for me with my programs. And I worked with youth and young adults since I was a youth and young adult myself. So we just didn't stop and we found ways that worked. So some folks found us when, you know, we were hollering at them from one of our health centers that sees a lot of patients, whether they got the newsletter or an invitation to the Zoom chat or as the Zoom chats kind of grew, you know, it's the pandemic. Sometimes the chats were really small with only two people showing up. Other times we had 10 people showing up. So the word got out, people were able to participate as best they could during the pandemic and in that virtual atmosphere. But shout out to my team because we just, we didn't stop. And we kept looking for ways to engage our young adults and we did it. So go Ryan my team. <laughs> Uh, and Kate, uh, there were some unexpected challenges that we faced with uh, with uh, some participants. Tell us about um, the individual that had some second thoughts once the campaign was rolling out. Yeah, so as we were recruiting ambassadors, our ambassadors are the beautiful faces you're seeing on the slides today, the young people with HIV who are willing to share their stories. And we we thought we were doing a good job of being very clear saying, hey, we're going to be on Instagram and Facebook. We're going to be on posters that we're putting in the various clinics around the valley. And we want to make sure that you know that your face is going to be on this campaign associated. So you are disclosing to the public that you are a person living with HIV. We thought we'd had great conversations about that. We recruited a, a group of young people 
who are excited to tell their stories. Recording those interviews, uh, Jeremy and I have talked and will continue to talk about how that was possibly the most rewarding work day of our lives to hear those stories and to be empowered and reminded that wow this is why we do the work we do so then we had all that great momentum we're feeling good and we design all the materials and distribute and one of our participants knew but wasn't ready for what that meant to have his face on a poster that he saw in his doctor's office and to to be associated with that so that person I don't want to say they had regrets after the fact, but I think they just didn't realize how big it was going to be. And that was an emotional shift for them. So cut to the next year when we're recruiting a new round of ambassadors, we were even more um, descriptive of how the campaign was going to grow. Because with the first round of ambassadors that we released in 2021, you know, that was more restricted to just providers, offices, and uh, materials that we would share at health fairs. With this new round of the campaign, we've got transit ads, ads on buses, um, you know, bus shelters. So it's much more visible than before, including more ads on dating apps, Google, social media. So we really let people know this is going to be even bigger than before. And we did have some folks who were interested at first that upon learning the scope of the campaign, decided to step back, whereas they wanted to share their story, maybe on a smaller scale. Having their face put across the city of Phoenix was not the draw for everyone. And so some folks did step back, whereas some of our other ambassadors were like, only Phoenix, not the entire state, not the nation. Give us time. To it. So we were just much clearer about the expectations and what it would mean to be an ambassador for this campaign for round two. And uh, so far, the feedback has been good. <laughs> Thanks for that. You know, Kate, I was with you when we were initially preparing the participants for their video interviews and their photography sessions. Um, I'd like you to share that experience with folks and how uh, that experience changed from the first set of models to the second, because I found it uh, a fascinating difference between the two. Yeah, it was really different. So with the first round, you know, we're, we're wanting folks to be prepared before they're going on camera. So John and I did a pre-interview where we went through the questions with our ambassadors. And when they shared those gems, we got so excited, oh my gosh, make sure you say that on camera. That was perfect. That is exactly the message we're going for exactly the attitude, the vibe, the delivery, yes. And then that young person would get in front of the camera and you would see them kind of like, wait, what was the thing I said that they really liked? And it came back, you know, it still sounded great, but it wasn't that natural, initial, authentic reaction that we got in the pre-interview. A little of that was lost on camera. So this time around, we did not tell them what questions to expect. We gave them a hint of one when we asked, you know, if there's one word to describe you, what would that be? How you're living your life now? We let them think on that one because that was a little harder. But the other questions were a surprise to them. So we caught those authentic reactions in the moment. It wasn't a, oh, Kate got really excited when I said that. What was it? It was on camera. It was fresh. And it it is shown in the videos with those more genuine responses. What about some of the organizational considerations that you had to ch address, like, you know, internal bureaucratic challenges, you know, approval processes, what have you? How did that go? Well, we are local government, so you know our Maricopa County communications team was part of the discussion, all the way to what hashtags we were allowed to use on social media. So that was very important to us to not only make sure that we were sharing the messages directly from the mouths of our young adult ambassadors, but also that it met our county standards for communications for the language that we use. So it was a very easy process working with the county. You know, Jeremy has got a great relationship with that team. And um, so all our forms from photo releases, to you know ambassador understanding to language that was all signed off not just from our ryan white team but up through county leadership as well 
But I've done enough talking. I'm very good at talking, as my colleagues will know. I want to shift to the heart and soul of this campaign. And I am so grateful that Elijah joined us today to talk. Elijah is one of our newer ambassadors. And then I'm going to throw it back to my fabulous colleague, Jeremy, who although was not the in the key population, nor even intending to sit in front of the camera, when we had someone drop out on the day of our first shooting, John and I may have been a little, I don't want to say pushy, encouraging. So I'm going to shift it now to let Jeremy and Elijah tell their stories because it's these stories that make Positive Review as successful as it is. Guys? Uh, thanks, Kate. Uh, so yeah, uh, the first wave of the campaign, um, the you've I think right before we jumped to this chat portion, you saw uh, my me on one of the images. Uh, that was never the intention. I was happy to be in the background to to uh, help with the development and and um, really lead the ambassadors through uh, this project. But the I can't remember if it was the night before. Um, or early the morning of the, the interviews, I got um, a message from our, it was supposed to be the last ambassador in the interview of the day. Um, and they notified me that they had a personal emergency and wouldn't be able to make it. And so we had booked the time at the studio. We were paying for the time of the of the crew to to do all the things. So we were we scrambled for the first three hours to try to see if we could find someone in the in the key populations to uh, to be on camera and interview. But you're asking someone with little notice to come on and, and share their story. And so by 11, uh, 11 a.m. we were we knew we were hitting a wall and it wasn't going to happen. And John looked at me and was like, do you think it might be time for you to tell your story? And I had a moment of probably about 30 second panic attack um, where I was like, oh no, it's here, it's it's coming. Um, and um, and then I took a breath and I said, and I and I really reflected, I'm sitting down off camera interviewing these individuals, these young people who are being brave and telling their stories and asking them to do something that I have yet to be willing to do myself and to be public about my status. Um, so I was like, all right, uh, it's go. Uh, we're gonna do this. Um, and I told Kate, I was like, if, uh, you're gonna you're gonna do the interview for me. So she sat off camera and 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 interviewed me. And um I started to share my story. And it I know it's this is my experience. Um, and my experience may not is I know is not everyone else's, but it was one of the most empowering moments. Um, and since then there's been a lot of you know, uh, build up to when like, it was four months between when we recorded and when the, the trailer for the for the campaign actually launched. And so I had a lot of time to think and second guess. Um, and uh, but it has been an overwhelmingly positive experience for me to be a part of and to also share this journey with um, the the ambassadors um, uh, that have chosen to be a part of this campaign. Um, they are the real heart and soul. I'm I was lucky and blessed to be a part of it, um, but that was never part of the plan. But as we began to look at how we can expand and move forward, we recruited a whole new group of ambassadors. Um, and I think Kate didn't really do it justice. It took us over a year to recruit six individuals the first time. And in the second wave, it took us only a matter of a month and a half to recruit seven individuals. And that was seven individuals who stayed after learning about the full scope of what the campaign was going to do. And one of those individuals is Elijah. So Elijah, thank you for joining us today. You want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, I'm Elijah. Um, I just uh, am a member of the community. I do a lot in the community. I wear several hats. I work in HIV healthcare, um, and I'm also positively your ambassador, and just kind of roundabout always been part of the HIV community uh, prior to my status, and now even more so uh, with my voice and my story. Awesome. So thank you again for joining us. We're really glad to have you have you with us. Um, my first question for you is. So what made you decide to be a, a part of the campaign, particularly in the second wave? Um, 
the first wave kind of happened around um, me still figuring out my status. So I was one of the during the pandemic individuals that uh, was diagnosed with HIV and I kind of had to deal with the isolation and the chaos of the pandemic mixed with my new diagnosis. So there was a lot of moving parts happening for me uh, in my head, connecting to the community, all of that. So it was more just me learning about what was available for me as a trans masculine person out there, me as a young adult, me as a newly diagnosed person. So I just kind of had my ear to the ground on what the community was doing and what services were available. So obviously I don't think I was ready at that time and I still was trying to figure out my voice. I did come out about my status several, uh, probably three or four months after my diagnosis, but even still, I was still kind of in the learning process. So it was actually you, Jeremy, that kind of gave me that final push to actually be an ambassador because I, I've known you around about for a while, but the biggest thing about this campaign that I love is being able to see you as a person living and thriving and when you see people that you recognize, see people that you care about, see people that, you know, look like you, then it gives you more of an incentive to want to stand up and share your story so that other people can see themselves and be able to get connected to the resources they need. Elijah, you said something really great, you know, seeing people that look like you in the campaign. One of the things I'm really proud of is the diverse representation of ambassadors we've had. You know, we have uh, a range of ethnic backgrounds. We've got trans women, trans feminine people, trans masculine people. You said something in your video that I love, which just dropped yesterday, day before we're recording this. So Elijah's content is fresh on my mind. Not only do you say, I'm not one to stay quiet on things, but we also had you speak specifically of your experience of being a trans masculine person and why it's important for this community to be aware of not only HIV, but right and white services and the U equals U message. Can you talk more about that, about the importance of seeing representation out there and what that meant for you? That was one of the initial things when I was first diagnosed um, was figuring out how many other trans men were like me. Um, being a trans masculine person that identifies as gay and part of this community is already has so much stigmatizing language and behaviors around it that it was really frightening for me. And I never met a trans man that um, was diagnosed with HIV or at least public about it. And a friend of a friend connected me with a trans masculine person that he was diagnosed four years prior to me. And he talked about his experience feeling so alone and that there was no resources, no support groups, no navigation. And even he dealt with a lot of harassment, discrimination, all of that, just trying to figure out where he can get support. And realizing when we connected that there's probably so many other trans men individuals out there that kind of feel the same way that I knew I had to kind of be part of this message in a way so that no one would feel what I felt. And it felt very lonely and it, the provider community doesn't really know that we are a risk and doesn't really know that we exist. There are trans masculine individuals that are HIV positive and we are, you know, part of this community. You talked a little bit about how we've known each other for quite a while and I've always known you as like, and I think I've said this before, you're just always authentic. You're always yourself and always who you are. So sitting down and interviewing you um, on camera was uh emotional for me because hearing your story and the and particularly the things you were just talking about about that loneliness and feeling isolated because one you're not your community is not represented 
often in in uh, uh, HIV messaging. But that was like I had a hard time holding it together on my end. Um, you did a lot better than I did um, <laughs> on, on camera. I was off camera trying to hold myself together, but I just really wanted to thank you, like uh, uh, share our appreciation for you uh, doing that and being a part of that. Because as Kate said, it really was about being intentional about who was a part of the campaign and, and how we were reaching communities that maybe aren't always um, reached in, in HIV messaging. So really thank you for, for being a part of that and, and for bringing that to light. Of course. Well, again, this is just going to be my final plug to everyone to please visit our website and to watch both Jeremy and Elijah and the rest of our ambassadors' incredible stories. We had a really hard time taking these beautiful 20, 30 minute interviews and distilling them to the American youth attention span of 90 seconds or so. But we knew it had the messaging had to be powerful and to the point. And I'm just so grateful for voluntary ambassadors like Elijah and nudge, nudge, push, push ambassadors like Jeremy who have made this campaign truly just so powerful and so wonderful and for people to see themselves in the campaign, whether it's English, Spanish, straight, LGBTQ+, I'm, I'm just so proud of both of you and our other ambassadors for your bravery. And thank you for sharing your stories because we took your quotes directly from your interviews and put them on posters because what you shared in your stories kind of did the work for us. So thank you. Your stories, your words are what make this campaign so successful and make our entire team at Maricopa County Public Health so proud that Positively You is ours. So, all right, I'm going to feel some feelings. And while I do that, John is going to take over from here and go into further detail about our strategy to conceptualize the campaign and develop the messaging and content. Thank you, Kate. Uh so as we were beginning to develop and outline the campaign, we were really conscious of not trying to duplicate exactly the experience of somebody coming into care face to face, but really creating through our messaging and our visuals and the content that we were showing, this um, sense of compassion and caring and desire to help you out as much as possible. And so as we started thinking about it a little bit more, um, we realized that if our primary goal is to connect with our audience, we want to activate them to do something. And in our case, it was to find out more information about the Ryan White program, more information about the services that you qualified for. And the activation on that was to apply for the program or contact um, a Ryan White provider for more information. So visit this website, call this number, go to this place. These are the things that we wanted um, people to feel. And to do this successfully, we recognized that we had to overcome both a physical gap, the actual distance that was between ourselves and the viewer of the campaign, as well as a mental gap, that there's a distance between our viewers' mindset and emotions and those that we wanted our campaign to convey. And so let's think about that a little bit. So if you're in person, you know, we close the physical gap by actually meeting face to face. And the things that that create that activation in an individual are the face to face interaction, the tone of your voice when you're speaking to them, the decorations in your office or in your workspace, um, the color around you, your verbal and nonverbal cues, your body language, how you're dressed. These all help people to connect with you and ultimately connect with what you want them to do. 
And those things also can overcome that mental gap, right? We hear compassion in a person's voice. We see empathy on their face. And slowly we recognize that we're in the same mindset. And again, that individual gets activated to do what we want them to do, get care and support services, um, become virally suppressed, um, and remain uh, treatment adherent long term. So if we do that, in a face-to-face -face setting, how can we close those gaps in a media campaign? So if we're first, we're looking at closing the physical gap, um, you know, we can't connect with them, we can't touch them in any way, and they're already distanced by a computer or by being in their car on the road or their bicycle on the street or in a group of people, what have you. The things that we really want to do to close that physical gap are look at ad size so that if i'm visiting a website and i see this large banner ad at the header of a page or i'm outside and i see a billboard or i'm at a bus stop and i uh look over my shoulder and i see this gigantic poster on the stop itself you know we've really got this in your face placement that closes that physical gap it can also just simply be the location, regardless of whether it's a print advertisement, an advertisement that you're seeing on the web, a radio ad that's drawing them in, um, they're on some sort of social connection app or other app and pop-up ads of various sizes show up. And we can also close that physical gap by repetition. The more and more that they see the message, the more and more likely they are to activate and do what you want them to do. But closing the mental gap is a bit trickier. So let's take a look at some sample ads that I have up here, and we'll see how well they close the mental gap or not, um, and why it's important to think about that mental gap as you're developing any campaign that you choose to implement. So let, first, let's look at the advertisement for this sports car, which I think is from 1967. So look at this. Um, it's a very colorful picture. You can tell right away it's a romantic encounter. It's got a beautiful car, a beautiful girl, a beautiful picnic, a beautiful scene. You are captivated by all of these visual things drawing you in because they all tell a story. You can look at this picture and you see the story is they are on a picnic, they're enjoying themselves, and you can also almost imagine yourself in this image. It, it's almost like you have stumbled upon them and it really engages you. And I think also if you think of the mindset of the 1960s where this car was probably pitched to a um, cisgender male audience, you can even see that this man, his back is to you because they want you to be that individual. So you, they want you to become immersed in this spot and realize that you can get to this place if you buy this car and this exact thing can happen to you. So as an individual who might be interested in buying a new car, just interested in cars in general, you're closing that, that um, mental gap between um, wanting a car or liking cars and actually being captivated into what this car and owning it could represent in your life and chances are pretty good that that would resonate with you and you might go and look at the car or find out more information about the car or actually buy the car right so let's contrast that to the mental gap um, and the next ad which is an actual ad um, historical ad in terms of addressing hiv um, and i think it it presents many of the things that for many years a person with HIV like myself saw as a way to promote treatment and prevention. So they were usually fear-based in some way, shocking in some way. Um, and as you can see here, just the tone of the ad, the text of the ad, 
you know, everything, her look on her face, this does not, um, it creates a level of discomfort with you. And hopefully, I think the intention of this ad was to make you so uncomfortable that you would learn more about the information. But you also have to be, you know, really careful that you're not creating so much discomfort that you're distancing folks even more so from that activation point, right? We talked about that, that the mental gap and we wanna close this in. So we really wanna drive people in somehow to connect and resonate with this ad. You know, does this image and um, design and lack of color and text do that? Or does it trigger a different reaction um, within you or within the viewer? And now let's look at a modern day, not so much an ad, but this was a, a video that was created by Greater Than AIDS. It was a series of videos promoting HIV prevention and treatment uh, and used a variety of um, drag queens, social media celebrities, and other well-known individuals to promote PrEP, to promote HIV testing, to promote viral suppression, undetectable equals untransmittable. And what's great about this is um, it's very high energy, it uses pop culture, it's sex positive, it's fact-based, um, and it really resonated with a lot of people because it was just engaging to watch. It wasn't language that was clinical or challenging to hear. And at the end of the day, you were watching folks actually perform. And then the secondary component was you were learning about PrEP and PEP. So the thing that I would um, say is that when we're trying to close these physical gaps and also these mental gaps, your messaging, your images, and the tone you use can cause a person to step back from your campaign rather than jump into it. And if you're um, more likely to increase the physical and emotional gaps between your audience and your initiative, if you create a way for them to jump into your campaign. And think about this too, for a person with HIV, the simple act of clicking a link on a website or picking up the phone to call someone means that that individual has to internally acknowledge they have HIV. They have to admit to themselves that they need information or help getting um, services and care. And they also may have to disclose their HIV status to someone else. They're gonna to have to talk about sex and sexuality. If they do meet in person, they may see somebody they know or somebody may see them. And that's a lot of anxiety to overcome. And so we really wanted to be careful um, and make sure that we could limit that anxiety and really pull people to jump into the campaign. And I think we did a great job of closing both the physical gaps and the mental gaps for our viewers. And we did that by utilizing input from the participants, the ambassadors in the campaign to guide the content, to guide the tone and design and other parameters that help make the campaign successful. And let me show you the process that we used. So first, let's look at a typical development process. You have the program, like Jeremy discussed, the program identifies its needs and its programmatic goals. Then usually we go out and we reach out to stakeholders in the community. We attempt to recruit participants for whatever we're doing. And we hold focus groups where um, they're usually fairly scripted and folks are giving us the information that we want from them. And then if you look at having come from a public health background at a county and a state level, you know, I think the general process is you have that community engagement, you go back, you work with your design team to design and develop your initiative, and you present it to your program leadership. 
um, you get approval from your program leadership, and then you they go higher and get organizational approval. You do your final design and production, you get your final program approval, and then your campaign is released. And so really what you've done is you've used um, people with HIV and stakeholders in your community to tell you the things that you wanted to know to implement this campaign, and then they were essentially done. And I'm really proud of Jeremy and Kate and myself because I think we recognize all having extensive Ryan White experience and knowing that the entire foundation of Ryan White care is built on community engagement and community input, right? All of our processes are designed for planning bodies to be representative of our, our communities and seek community input and complete needs assessments from the community to get feedback and client satisfaction surveys and all of these things that are really designed to get the community involved and keep them involved. And so we really use that as a model for our work. So if you look at the process we use, yes, Jeremy um, identified his programmatic need and the goals that he wanted to accomplish. But then we moved to that participant recruitment and that focus group stage. And instead of asking the questions that we had that we wanted answers to, we just start letting those folks talk. What was their experience like with their diagnosis? What was their experience living with HIV? Did they experience any stigma or discrimination or feel any internal stigma? How were they moving forward with their lives? How did they disclose to other people? Really just give us this good sense about themselves and their journey. And then highlight in it in red here and specifically in a different color, it may be a little bit more orange, um, we also completed some empathy mapping exercises. And in this process, we asked the participants to create fictional personas, representations of people like them in the community, and then have them map out what their thoughts and feelings and knowledge about HIV were, if they were living with HIV, what were their informational needs were, how they might want to um, interact with service providers in the community, and also what, what would be driving them to activate on a campaign like this. And this was really a process that was just, here's the exercise, go off and do it. And they came back to us with very specific things about, what the website, Kate shared this, um, and Jeremy shared this as well, what the website should look like, how, what the tone of our ads should be, why people were going to click through this, what information was most important, um, and also how to convey that information and organize it in meaningful ways for the folks that we were trying to reach. And ultimately, I think it was a really empowering experience. And I know Elijah, um, I don't know if you took part in that process. I think we only worked with our original group to um, when we were developing the campaign. But then we came back and we met with our designers and um, did the development work and the production work to create um, three different iterations of what the campaign could look like. And then again, we moved right back to people with HIV in the community to not only have those comps presented to us, but also presented to the participants and other people with HIV for feedback, which one they felt was most compelling, why it resonated with them. Did we need to tweak it at all? Um, did they want to be a part of it? Like, would it really motivate them to take action? And we used that second round of information to further um, define and finesse the campaign, worked through with the programmatic and organizational pr approvals that we needed, and then came back with our final campaign and its content back to the participants and the people with HIV that we engaged to be our advisors, got their approval on it, and then moved into the final design and production stage and eventually release the campaign. So you can see here that, you know, almost every other step in our process went back to people with HIV to 
get information, to make sure it was working correctly, um, and really moving forward in that way. And, you know, Elijah, talk to me about the first time that you saw the campaign um, and what it was like seeing that and seeing the words of other people with mm -hmm. HIV, but also the words you eventually contributed to the campaign as well. I'm trying to remember the exact time I saw that campaign, but I believe it was in an email um, that I received. I I believe I enrolled in being able to receive the young adults uh, newsletter. Um, so I did see all of it come through, and I I immediately thought it was very um, easy to read and very thorough. But it kind of brings me back to just my own personal thought when I was first diagnosed of not having that thought process of it being kind of scary and sad and all of these kind of emotions because prior to that what I knew about HIV was the language that was similar to what was presented earlier about it being kind of stigmatizing and scary and kind of using fear tactics in a way to kind of get people to be interested so this felt very the way I perceive it as it's just another part of me and there is access to care and help available to kind of just continue your life. So it kind of kind of hit the mark with exactly how I felt. John, I remember uh, we, we had a, quite a discussion on the website content. Can you talk a little bit more about how we prioritize that? Yeah, so I as we worked with the community, it became very clear that the specific components of the campaign, which was apply now, here are what services are available, and apply now, apply today, were what people really wanted to take away from this. And even if they were engaged, if they were on an app and they clicked through to the website, you know, it gave them very basic information. They could bookmark it, come back to it at a later date, and you weren't going through a lot of information to get to be able to do what you and what we wanted you to do. Apply now, see what services you qualify for, get the help that you need. And as we worked with folks, you know, there was a lot of discussion about you know, wrap around HIV prevention messaging, and we needed messaging that included PrEP and condom use and where to get testing. And all of a sudden we were, we had this very specific message that was suddenly getting more bloated and more bloated with all of this wraparound content that in the end, our participants said, we can get that in other places we need to get the one thing that we're coming to this website for and it does not have to be a huge website as kate said i only want to scroll once or twice to get to where i need to go and if you make me work too hard or too long to do that i'm just going to go away and i think it really speaks to when you look at the website just how concise and curated and specific that it is to exactly what we want them to accomplish with uh, a set of curated links that can take them to that external and other wraparound content if they want it. And just in the interest of time, I'm going to segue because Jeremy, you've got some uh, great things that you want to talk about in terms of online engagement and some partnerships that you had with the campaign. So I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, thanks, John. So um, we talked, we've already talked about most or all of the campaign components um, throughout this presentation, but I want to take you through just how it all kind of comes to, together um, and how, what we're bringing to our community. So for online engagement, uh, you know, we talked about the website and we mentioned it several times, but it really serves as the hub of all of our resources, our Positively You Ambassador Stories, uh, our Services Guide, a recently added eligibility page, um, with motion graphics on how um, on how to apply and, and what you need for your first eligibility appointment, um, as long along with our partner organizations we highlight and and uh, 
you know, some frequently asked questions. Um, Kate's talked about the newsletter, um, but really what that highlights is now is more upcoming events, up-to-date information, programmatic changes, or uh, new resources that are available. Um, and then we use social media to um, Instagram and Facebook to promote our services. As you can see the, the, uh, the handle at the bottom of the screen. Please feel free to follow us. Um, but really, we use that to promote our services, our providers, um, our partners, and share our ambassador stories. And um, while we only have about 365 uh, Instagram followers at the moment of this recording, we're getting a lot of reach in our stories and in our reels, where we're seeing much more engagement on, on those. And so that's really exciting for us. Um, through those various components, um, our centralized eligibility office here in Maricopa County for the Ryan White Party program has been tracking how this campaign is connecting individuals uh, either uh, new to our program or those returning back to our program. And when um, through the first six months of the campaign, about 22% of individuals, when asked uh, the question, how did you hear about us, referred to social media or our website as the reason they were getting connected back to care. So that's really exciting. And as our, our reach on social media and our presence in the community grows, that number actually continues to go up. So we're really excited about this next wave and seeing the results in the next few months about how that number has shifted. And next, I'm going to talk about positive peers. This is not um, something that was from our program, but actually um, a number of us from the Young Adult Support Squad at the last National Ryan White Conference attended, unbeknownst to each other, we all were on the positive peers presentation from um, the Metro Health System in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, so we immediately knew that we wanted this app or something like it to be brought into our community. So um, we ended up being able to become a key health partner with the Positive Peers app. If you're not aware of it, it is an app that is designed for and by young people with HIV ages 13 to 34. It provides access to a private support network and powerful health tools such as viral load trackers, discrete medication reminders, message boards, chat features, an incredible set of blogs, some award-winning blogs, um, and local resources that we were able to help curate with the, the folks at Positive Peers for our community, and so much more. And the data for the app shows that users of the app um, are four times more likely to stay virally suppressed than their peers who are not using the app. That's really, really substantial. Um, and so we are really excited and we were able to roll this out the same time we rolled out the Positive Lead You campaign. So we are, um, again, we're not the holders of this app. So if you are interested, we have the contact information on the screen for Jen McMillan Smith from the Metro Health uh, System in Cleveland, Ohio please reach out to her. She would be would be happy to walk you through how you can become a health partner or promote this app in your community. Kate, you want to talk about community engagement? I would love to talk about community engagement. You know, before the Positively You campaign, uh, Ryan White Part A was kind of a like a secret club in the greater Phoenix metro area that if you weren't getting services directly, you didn't know what it was, who Ryan White was, so it was very confusing. So now with Positively You as kind of our, our brand, it's become for Ryan White Services in Maricopa and Kanawha Counties, we're out in the community for the first time. You know, yes, Part A was always at AIDS Walk with our little table with all the other providers, but now we're at Phoenix Pride. We're going to all sorts of community events, the Rainbows Festival, health fairs. One of our partners does these great loteria nights with every Thursday. So Positively You has been able to go to a really fun community event. Anytime there's a drag performer, I'll be there. And just to share the messaging and to get the word out there about our services. That's what the data showed us from the beginning, that even our own clients didn't know what services were available to them. And through all of our online, social media, web engagement, and now our physical presence in the community, 
we're getting the word out there about what Ryan White can do to support people with HIV. And we're really succeeding in a really fun way. And we're getting attention. On the next slide, I've got a shout out to the fabulous folks at the City of Phoenix Fast Track Cities Initiative, who when they were looking for a way to invest their dollars, you know, were they going to create their own media campaign? No, they saw Positively You and saw that we were onto something pretty great, and they invested in us. And I'm so proud of our Part A collaboration with the Fast Track Cities Initiative really working with our community partners so that we're working smarter together, not making our jobs harder by trying to duplicate efforts separately. So thanks City of Phoenix for the extra funding that's really let us grow this program. So we're gonna wrap this up on the next slide. Oh, hey, it's our website again. And our social media handles, you should all be getting out your phones right now and following at Positively UAZ on Instagram or Facebook. TikTok content hopefully coming soon. Um, thanks again to the city for letting us grow the program and invest our resources in making Positively You a success. And on the next slide, oh, look at those beautiful ambassador faces. Thank you again to Jeremy and Elijah for your bravery in sharing your story and putting your face and your story on this campaign. Thank you to John and his team for guiding the process and empathy mapping and helping us bridge the gap and to all the young people who gave us feedback and guided this program you're why it's as successful as it's been and we're getting this level of attention so thank you positively you ambassadors if you want to talk to the team here is our information please follow jeremy on instagram as well at positively jeremy i love his campaign and i'm shouting it out now um, and myself and John as well, if you're looking to duplicate a campaign like this for your jurisdiction, we love talking about Positively You, and we would love for you to have the same success with your campaign in your community. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Let's get some Q&A done, shall we? So huge thank you to our presenters, uh, Kate, John, and Jeremy for addressing uh, not only the topic, but the methodology and all the hard work that goes through it. Um, we're gonna pose some questions to the attendees that have, we've been collecting throughout the presentation. Um, I know we're supposed to finish at 1245. So uh, if we go a few minutes over, that might be okay, but we can't go too many minutes over. So just a heads up there. Uh, you can still submit questions using the chat feature. They've shared their information uh, in the chat box uh, during the presentation. So uh, they've also had staff taking notes on uh, all of the wonderful emails you've been putting in there for reaching out. So uh, they're on top of it. And in the, uh, speaking of uh, coordination things, I just want to take a moment to recognize one of our fellow Bureau of Public Health Analyst, Commander Anita Edwards, uh, for helping us collect the questions and uh, making sure that I, I, I at least get as many as I can. Uh, so thank you, Anita. Uh, thank you for the presenters for staying on camera during the live Q&A. Um, so let's just uh, get right into the fun. Um, Esther Ross uh, asked, were incentives provided to participants and what processes were put in place to leverage funding for incentives? Yeah, so uh, I don't know that we said a ton about this, but the original um, way the campaign and most of the campaign is funded through ending the HIV epidemic funding. Um, and then, as Kate mentioned, we got some uh, um, additional funding from the City of Phoenix uh, Fast Track Cities Commission to, to fund this. So that's the funding streams. So we'll start with that. Um, as for incentives, yes, we did provide some stipends to the individuals who uh, participated for their time for the interview um, and photo shoots. Um, so that was something we did. We um, wanted to do more, um, but when we started, we had a very a pretty limited budget um, to build the whole campaign. Um, one of the things that we did do is we went to HRSA, you know, with Ryan White and any HIV epidemic funding, it can be a little tricky um, when it comes to incentives or stipends, um, but we went, um, to our project, our EHE project officer, and um, said, you know, we're asking people to be basically models. So that was the term we used. They're models um, for the campaign. Um, so we should be um, able to pay them as as models. Um, so that's what we were able to do. And when we were um, then with the fast track cities funding, we were able to up the incentive um, 
um, a little bit more, uh, not maybe sufficient um, as, as much as we would, would like to for their time and their their bravery and their um, um, putting their faces on, on a campaign like this, but that's how we were able to do it. And then we um, that was all run through our uh, consultants and vendors who were working with us on the campaign. They um, they handled the, the stipends and the incentives. And then you all did get some great comments early on about the use of the call to action approach and the efforts to have individuals understand their path to undetectable status. So just credit where credit's due. Uh, Chris Pauler asks, how was the survey administered email, social media, and was it only to current young party clients or was it to others? And Jeremy answered that, uh, that it was, uh, survey was administered in a few ways and uh, email was, uh, we did send it by email, but also had a table at one of the locations where uh, multiple CBOs and HIV clinics were located at times when young people were likely in the building. Case managers also shared it directly with their clients. Most were part A clients, but that was not a requirement. The table uh, worked best. Uh, Kate and a young adult case manager really engaged people as they were coming into the building. That brings us to Dale Brees. Um, and by the way, just a small note, if I'm doing my best to make sure I don't mispronounce anyone's name, as you can see, I have three vowels in my last name, so I'm sensitive to it. Uh, so uh, I do, I'll do my best. But Dale Brees, have we seen how the messaging that HIV is a chronic manageable disease and how that makes the folks less likely to engage in HIV services? I'll take this one. Um, one of the things that's really great about our ambassador videos is they talk about that difference and they talk about, you know, people's perceptions of what HIV is versus what HIV actually is. And a lot of our young folks talk about, I take one pill a day and I go on with my life. You know, some days I forget I have HIV. So that undetectable equals untransmittable message is really strong throughout the campaign content, especially those videos, because it is our young folks sharing their story of what they think thought HIV was before their diagnosis, during, and then through the support of the Ryan White program, how their attitudes shift, and the importance of speaking out now so that we can really let people know, hey, it's not, it's not 1995 anymore. We are in a whole different place when it comes to HIV care and treatment, and HIV does not define me. So that was really great to see. I might add on to that. You know, I think it also speaks to the great work that folks locally have done uh, regarding rapid start and uh, stressing the important, importance of uh, quick engagement and care. I think to a participant, uh, every single person that participated in the campaign talked about uh, having compassionate, knowledgeable folks who kind of set the tone about them engaging in care and the importance of that to live healthy and well. I think. I think some, you know, some had shared that they weren't ready to receive that yet or act on that yet, or, you know, they knew about that. So when I read your question, I kind of interpreted that as people are kind of thinking because we have treatment for HIV, they don't necessarily have to worry about getting HIV anymore. And I, I don't think we found a lot of that in, in our work, so. All right, so we'll just a quick comment here about Tyra West and Marcella Z and others um, had been asking about the newsletter, access to that, the toolkits, materials. And as you saw, um, the team did provide their emails, but also throughout the chat, um, you've been, you, the attendees have been putting in your email. So they're capturing it. Uh, of course, positively, you az.com is the email address there's um social media which is the instagram page uh, apparently also jeremy's uh as instagram page too is available um so uh so that's positively jeremy with the ad sign please uh but put your email in the uh, chat if you already haven't uh they have staff members looking at it to make sure they get those copies and examples out to you and um, Casey Courtney, you had asked about, will you be willing to share your survey? That goes in the same line of uh, capturing your emails and getting those out. Uh, Russell Campillo, are the peers also living with HIV or just of youth age or both? And the answer to that was all of our 
uh, PY ambassadors and program participants are young adults with HIV. Um, Marcella Z did ask, is this becoming a national campaign for young people or just Maricopa County for now? I didn't know how to address that. Well, um, I think the session like this, my two cents is the federal side is sessions like this will enable us, the federal side, to connect you, um, you know, catch 22 for uh, Maricopa, because obviously sometimes resource can be limited. But as you can see in this, we have a, a person, a, a person, a entity that's best practices and we can connect them. But I'll let the team talk about their thoughts on that. I mean, we're always willing to share. I mean, that's the great thing about uh, the funding that we receive. It is not our own, right? So um, we are always willing to share. And if you're wanting to um, use what we've built to to bring something to your community and adopt for your community, I think that that's a that's great. So we're we're willing to have those conversations and 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 provide support for that. Yay, Ryan White funds are working. Um, yeah. So Marcia Richards uh, asks, who is responsible for developing and implementing the social media campaign? Uh, there was some response from the team that we did contract with a vendor to build all the things, websites, social media content, posters, interview videos, and then to purchase and manage ad buys. We have staff that run and manage our social media day to day. So they've got a uh, uh, a team on it. And um, if you guys want to expand on that too. Yeah. One thing I want to put out there, it takes time, staff time to grow a social media presence. Like, and it's more, you know, it's not just five hours a week that you can set aside. So knowing, studying the algorithm of Instagram and what days you need to post reels versus what days you need to post stories. Um, how many posts are going to get attention? I am so impressed by my team. You know, I aged out of the uh, young adults category a while ago, but working with our ambassadors, our young staff members, and shout out to our leadership on the Part A team at Maricopa County for acknowledging, okay, we are going to invest staff time into building this so that we can have that engagement, we can have that presence. And I just, I cannot stress that enough. Social media takes more time than you think it should, but if you do devote the staff time and energy, you get the great results and you get the great following that we're seeing on our staff, so. Um, thank you. Ellen Dillon had asked about the timeline uh, from start to launch. And Ellen, uh, you can see in the chat that question was answered. So in the interest of time, there was, um, and I don't mean to gloss over anyone's uh, answers, but if it's been answered, we're going to keep going. There was a, um, I would call this a little bit of a posing a general question that was asked, are people ex experiencing extra stigma being diagnosed with HIV in the age of PrEP? So I think this individual is just looking to see what your experience through this effort may have shown, if, if anything different. Um, I don't know that I don't know that I've seen that. Um, I could see how that is a question, though, um, and I could see how that could be become an issue. But I don't know that we've seen that. Again, um, my experience is not everyone's experience, so. Um, uh, as they say it's at this time right it's what yeah we do now things could change in the future hopefully not because stigma is bad uh, in our but, in our yeah. first run of ambassadors i will say we had someone who volunteered to be interviewed a month literally a month after they were diagnosed like we found that out the day of their uh of their interview that it was a month prior that they'd been diagnosed um they so were already undetectable at this and point. we're already undetectable. Yeah, it's in. It, it was so that was actually like we've come so far that someone can be brave enough at that point already a month in to be able to you know tell their story publicly like that. Um, but I think there, you know, I think it's more. I don't know about the um, the stigma or shame from the community. I think a lot of times it's more internal. Like, how come I wasn't on prep? I think that's what I've seen more often than more of it coming from community. And that was a theme in the stories as well, as I'm sure it's been a theme in the lives of many, a person who's been diagnosed with HIV. It's that internal stigma. What didn't I do when I could have done something else? You know, we, and what the beauty of the Positively You campaign is, it's like, you know, you're, 
you're here now, we've got you. There's a system and a community here to support you. So it's really trying to break stigma at multiple levels. One of our focus areas of the Part A program and our ending the epidemic focus is on community education and breaking down stigma. Because we know until we address stigma at multiple levels, you're gonna see people hesitate to get tested. You're gonna see people hesitate to get on PrEP or start uh, treatment if they do test positive. Mm -hmm. So through educational campaigns like this, yes, our primary goal is to engage young adults with HIV and get them to enroll in Ryan White services, but we're also educating the community as well. People who thought that they're still, oh, you have to take 20 pills a day. You know, again, I, I hearken back to those 90s perceptions of what it means to live with HIV. And so our education is not just driving folks to Ryan White, it's also educating our greater Phoenix, Maricopa and Pinal County communities. Here's what HIV looks like today. It's, it's changing and you can still be you. So, yeah. We had a question from uh, Dale Brees. How did you get feedback from folks who might not be in sync with empathy in general? John, you want to take that? Yeah, so, so I think here's the thing that I would say about that is we were really careful like in a lot of things, for example, Jeremy and Kate and their team member, Javier, did a lot of things where they took materials out to the community, like at Pride events, they actually sat in an agency for an entire day, and as people were walking in and out, asked them to take a look at the, the materials that we had and other things that they were doing programmatically. So it's not just you're looking at that focus group and you're you're trying to, to create those personas, you're actually getting real-time feedback from people uh, in the community that are not your typical, yes, I'll show up to everything that's got uh, an incentive card attached for my feedback type of thing. So I think they really did a great job of that. Also, remember these empathy, the empathy map is really designed for people to share their own personal experiences through a third person. So they're creating somebody that represents who they are in the community and what information they think is important and how they need to move through it. And so what that really does is really give you a great idea of the mindset of folks and how they need to find the information and what's important and relative to them. Because programmatically, what's important and relevant to us is not always necessarily the case. And I've seen where it's actually varied quite a bit, but you still wanna get them to where you want them to be programmatically. So, so I encourage you, you know, it's very difficult. A lot of times public health programs are um, administrative and not necessarily collaborative with their communities. And I think the thing that's really important is to set up those relationships so that you have access to people with HIV that are not just your typical um, uh, usual suspects, if you will, that can really drive your content in a much more diverse way. Thank you. Uh, the, the elaboration is, is, I think we could spend a whole nother session on it if we had time. So I, I appreciate you all uh, staying on. We have less than three minutes. We do have a hard stop at uh, 1250 Eastern time. So Nicole Mandel asked, Jeremy, what was the VLS number for the Positive Peers campaign? So for Positive Peers, um, that's the one for out of Metro Health, uh, the app that we partner with. Um, there's this, it's four times, I don't know what the, I don't know what percentage or anything like that, but they, their, their research shows, um, that individuals are four times more likely to be virally suppressed than their peers when using, um, or not using the app. Um, for, for us, we've always shown a disparity in, in, in young people. Um, it's currently sitting at about, uh, 78% virally suppressed, um, um, in our community, um, but we are seeing more young people starting to use our services. That's what we've been seeing, and we're starting to see more than link to care. Um, so um, our, you know, our next focus of this is really honing the, honing the message about the wraparound services. Dale asked a question 
um, I think, uh, clarified his question in the chat too about um, how, you know, when when we do know that complementary HIV uh, funds also support the tools around the journey of living with HIV, that's not just one pill a day. And that's really what um, where we're trying to focus is that, you know, the in the medical care is there, we know the medical advances are there, but individuals aren't getting virally suppressed or staying in care because they're not aware of or accessing the supportive services around them. Um, so that's where we're trying to focus those efforts. And I think we might have to be this the last question uh, Ed, because we do want to get uh, wrap it up soon. Ellen Dillon asked, what was your total budget for this project? Kate, you're on mute. I'm counting in my head, Jeremy. You are you are my budget guy. <laughs> so um, we originally started with 50, 50 grand um, to to build the campaign, but then included building the website, doing the videos, doing all the things. Um, so our ad buy was very limited in the beginning, only about six thousand dollars of that was ad buy. Um, so most of it was grassroots, being out in the community, having our providers and our partners share the stuff. So that's where it built. Then the fast track cities gave us an additional 50 grand um, to do the next wave, bring in new ambassadors, do a much bigger ad buy. So we're now doing ads on Grinder and Scruff, um, and we're seeing great results from those. We don't have those, those are currently running. Otherwise, we would have been sharing because they are some, we're getting some great data, some great engagement um, out of those. We've also been partnering with influencers lately um, through that funding. And then um, yeah, so then we have some additional like maintenance funding for the just for the website and and so and for updates there. Thank you uh, to the Maricopa team. Um, you know, Kate, John, Jeremy. Uh, thank you everyone for your participation. As we close out, please remember uh, the, these are timely and interesting uh, topics. Uh, but we do also want you to fill out those session evaluations at the end of each session. If you're continuing, if you're seeking continuing education credits, uh, make sure you complete the additional evaluation for that credit. You can do that simply by returning to the session, session page platform and clicking on the blue evaluation links. Uh, thank you again for joining. And most of all, thank you for everything you do every day for the communities that you serve. It is not lost on us, um, the effort that it takes. And hopefully this was another step that big piece of puzzle that you put together. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of the conference. We'll see you all in the neighborhood.